everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I wanted to welcome you to Writing for Tweens and In-Betweens, where YA authors are going to share their latest unputdownable books. Please join me in welcoming our authors, Kekla Magoon, Lori Forrest, Joel Knowles, and Linda Urban. And I will let them take it from here. Yay. All right, before we really, really get started, we wanted to get a sense of who's here. So who among you might be writing for a YA-ish kind of audience? Awesome. Who reads for a YA kind of world? Awesome. Who's in the wrong place? <laughs> uh, we also wanted to get a sense, because we love to talk about this stuff, we want to make sure that we save the time for questions. Questions will emerge as we come, but how many of you already have a question in mind? Like, you came here because there's something you want to know. We just want to get a sense of that. All right. Then instead, we talked in advance about how we would like to run this, and we're really going to ask each other questions for a bit. And Lori was willing to start us off. So Lori. <laughs> there you go. So my question after Googling everybody and reading about their books was um, what their current muse is, what's inspiring them. And I can start, and I think that what we'll also do is tell you who we are, what we write. So I'm Linda Urban. For the most part, for most of my published writing career, I've written picture books and chapter books and middle grade. And my most recent book is a seasonal book, actually, called Talk Santa to Me. Um, it is about a girl and her family. They run a holiday shop in uh, Indiana. And she has a, an evil aunt who really wants to tank that shop and the Santa Claus school that goes along with it. So it's a family story and a work story and a holiday story. And there's a first kiss romance in this story as well. And maybe if we get around to it, I can talk about why it is a YA story and not any of the other things, and also how I did my research by going to Santa Claus School, which if you want to feel young and spelt, go to Santa Claus School. Uh, but that is not my current muse for a book that I'm doing right now. Uh, it's a much angrier kind of YA. Um, and it's funny because the, the muse is for it, one are Girl Scout badges. I'm, it's a metaphor and a structure that I'm using to talk about the things that we internalize uh, and what badges we might hide or carry around with us. And also I'm really interested in, and anybody who went to our notebook panel knows, where we were talking a lot about play. And so one of the muses for me, even though it doesn't come into that book specifically, is um, Dungeons, Dragon, Dungeons and Dragons, particularly live play, particularly Dimension 20. Does anybody watch on Dropout Dimension? Yes, my friend, right? <laughs> so watching these grown-ups who do um, uh, improv comedy play Dungeons and Dragons together has opened up all kinds of play and character and storytelling for me. So those are my music. That's what I write. Joe. <laughs> In classic Joe style, I didn't bring my any of my tween books to hold up, um, but my most recent one is called Where the Heart Is, and it's about, uh, it's very uh, biographical, my, probably my most, uh, about a girl whose family is in financial crisis, they're about to lose their home to um, foreclosure, and she's also questioning her sexuality. Um, and the book I brought, though, is the companion <laughs> novel to that, which is, uh, not, you don't need to read one to read the other, but this is about her um, younger sister, Ivy. It's her story. So speaking of muses, um, when I was working on Where the Heart Is, Ivy, the younger sister, she was such a joy to write. She's just this really silly, precocious kid, and my editor wrote in the margin, Ivy needs her own book. Mm -hmm. And um, since I didn't have an idea for a book yet, I <laughs> emailed her and said, were you serious? <laughs> and what a joy it was to write for, I had never written for uh, about a nine-year-old kid before. This was definitely younger, younger. I started out writing upper YA. So I think we should always just follow that muse, at whether someone hands it to you in, in the margin of a, of a note. Um, and so I've, I did that, and I've, I guess, 
right now my current muse is a uh, total step, another step outside of my regular comfort zone and I'm working on some nonfiction essays for adults about caring for my in-laws, which feels, I have a real sense of urgency, I was telling someone earlier, to write that. And so again, I'm following my muse even though it doesn't make sense career-wise. Um, again, that's just typical of me, <laughs> so, oh well. <laughs> I'm Laurie Forrest. I'm the author of The Black Witch Chronicles. Um, and uh, I guess it's, I've heard it described as a feminist Lord of the Rings with romance and kissing. So, uh, yeah, and I'm amused right now. This is a, this is a um, six book series and I'm finishing up the sixth book right now. But um, my news right now, I think is definitely the environmental crisis. My main character is a dryad, a tree face, so. It's, there's a lot of them out in these books, um, there's a lot of trees, and yeah, that's what I'm thinking about these days. I'm Kai Flo. Uh, I write fiction and nonfiction, so I did bring show and tell for my nonfiction, um, which is a Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People. And my most recent YA novel as well is called The Minus One Club. This is, um, this is a novel that I actually had worked on for quite a while. It's written in kind of a vignetted style um, where it's got a lot of short chunks. Um, and it is a novel about, it's about grief, but also about first love and also about figuring out who you are. There's a lot going on in this book. Um, and um, so the, the premise is that Kermit is the main character. He is 15. He's a sophomore in high school. He is gay and he knows this. His older sister knew, but she was the only one who knew. And at the beginning of the story, um, he, her sister is killed in a car accident before the story begins. Um, and so it's a novel about him. He's grieving the loss of his sister, but he's also grieving the loss of the one person who really knew who he was. Um, and so when he returns to school, um, the, right after her funeral, he finds a mysterious card in his locker that says, be in the art room after school at 2.45 today. You know, we know what you're going through sucks, but we can help, minus one. And the little, little minus one notation in the corner. And so he's like, whatever, he's too like wrecked to do anything. And so he shows up at the, in the art room uh, and he finds this group of kids um, from all different, you know, we've got our you know, breakfast club style, right? We've got our, our jock and our newspaper kid and our um, kind of goth artsy girl and, um, and whatnot. Um, but so there's this group of kids who wouldn't otherwise be friends um, who have all lost somebody really close to them who meet in secret as a way of providing support for each other. Um, and their rule is we don't talk about it. We get together and we do anything but talk about it. Uh, we just know. We don't talk about it, we just know. Um, and so for, for Kermit, that's really comforting in the beginning because you know he doesn't want to talk about it but, and nobody gets it, so it's nice to have this sort of safe space. Um, but it also, over the course of the story, becomes clear that they're all not talking about some stuff that maybe they should be talking about. And so it's about figuring out how to do that and who to do that with that's safe. Um, and one of the boys in the club is the boy that Kermit has a crush on. <laughs> um, so that it also becomes a story about first love. But first love in the context of being afraid to really show who you are. Um, in his, he, he's also set in Indiana, um, and he has grown up in a conservative um, evangelical Christian household, and he knows that his dad's not going to approve if he comes out. So, he's, so it's not a coming out story. It's a, it's a not coming out story in the midst of all of this. So, um, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Oh, my muse. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I write a lot of really serious and like heavy <laughs> stories, um, civil rights and things like this, uh, and that's what comes naturally to me and comfortable and easy. Um, and I was at various points I say, no, I'm gonna write something lighthearted and fun and wonderful. Um, and then I try and it always ends up being like super serious and civil rights. You know what I mean? um, so <laughs> my my forthcoming um, book is my forthcoming YA novel that's coming out in May. 24 is called Prom Babies, and it is <laughs> an intergenerational story about three girls who 18 years ago all got pregnant on prom night in different ways. Uh, I mean, the same way, but <laughs> <laughs> each, of, each of their individual stories as to how that happened is different, okay? So we follow, we follow, <laughs> follow their three stories and then 18 years later in the present day their three kids are I mean so spoiler alert they all keep their babies because they're going to um, prom they're getting ready to go to prom too and so each of them have their own storyline of sort of coming to terms with various aspects um, of their own lives 
Uh, and so it's really, it's actually really fun and lighthearted. I mean, it turned out to be a, you know, okay, now I have to talk a lot about the person's right to choose because <laughs> the law changed between the time that I sold the book and then we had the Supreme Court decision that um, made the idea of three girls keeping their babies like sound more political than I had meant it to be. Um, <laughs> so there's a little bit of that going on, which is how it became more serious. But this is a long way of saying, that that book has these two amazing, vibrant, queer girl characters named Amber and Carmen who are in like the one of the most like loving, positive, supportive, beautiful relationships I've ever seen or written on the page. Um, and there are only one, so Amber is the one of the six main characters and Carmen's a secondary character. And those two characters um, like just, it's weird to say this about my own writing, but they just burst off the page. Like these girls are so much fun to spend time with. And uh, my editor came to me and said, that they need their own book. Amber and Carmen need their own book. And so my current muse is my editor because I got so excited <laughs> about the idea of writing Amber and Carmen their own book that that's gonna be my next YA project that I pitch. Um, so, yeah. Do you have a question? Oh. Me? Or sure, either. Either. <laughs> I, mean, Kekla? I do have a question. I have many questions because I, have, I want to know how to do what you all do, <laughs> um, which is different from what I do. Um, so actually, my question was about actually a process question of how um, how you kind of enter your stories because. You know, I'm a very haphazard writer. That's how I end up writing, you know, something in vignettes because that's how the work comes to me. It comes to me in these weird chunks, and then at some point I have to sit down and make sense of it. And so there are other people who have a more linear style. Um, and for me, it's always been, it's always felt wrong that the way that I do it has always sort of felt wrong. Like I feel like you're supposed to sit down with an outline and have a little chart and be able to say what happens in all 26 chapters and know that there are going to be 26 chapters when you set out, um, and that. It's an intimidating place to start when you feel like the way that you want to enter the story is wrong. So it's something I've struggled with for years just to feel like okay with my process. Um, and so I'm curious about what your process is and how you enter the story and what your like what your approach to I guess finding structure in the story is. I'm especially interested in Lori doing this <laughs> for my yeah. series. Yeah. I feel I feel funny commenting on process because my, my process is so completely chaotic and messy and nonlinear and ridiculous that it, it doesn't deserve such a... That's such so a comforting. Time. That's so comforting to hear. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> when I first... I wrote the first two books in the series, not ever thinking I could get, get published. I just got this idea and then I started writing and I just couldn't stop writing. I would literally pull off the, the side of like, like at the general store in a snowstorm and just be writing down ideas in a circle, uh, unlike my date book. It was ridiculous. But, um, you know, we, we kind of melded things into the books and I'm really happy with them. But then now I'm working on the very last book and it, you can kind of go off on tangents with the first five books, but you can't do that on the last book. So I finally had to have a process. Mm. And so my editor gave me something called Save the Cat, which is a, um, it's a book, I guess it's one of the most popular books used in film school. That, that this guy did was he took all the, the, the most popular films and he tried to break them down of how, how the story arc went into what do they all have in common. And um, like you basically have this moment, like in the beginning, most stories that people love or, or movies that are blockbusters, they have an initial incident that throws the whole world upside down, and then the characters have to deal with it. And then there's a whole, there's these little signposts, you know. So I used that book, and I was forced to actually do for the first time ever an outline. It's very hard for me, because yeah. if you don't write like that, it's really hard to, but you have yeah. to in the last book in a series, otherwise you have chaos. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> no process at all except that book. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't really have a process either, although that feels kind of like a lie because if I look at it, I think, oh, I, it seems like I do the same thing every time. Mm -hmm. But I think if you back up a little bit, it's sort of like, well, I, you know, for the people in the audience who want to be writers and sort of like, well, where do your ideas come from or how do you decide what to write about or that sort of thing. Um, I think for me, I spent the most most of my writing career um, sort of writing about the things that haunt me um, personally. And so most of my books are 
about things that I myself have experienced and gone through. And so I guess like writing, I don't want to say writing is my therapy, but um, it certainly has been a, I, I write from, I write what I know. When I was a kid, my mom would tell me that, I think that's like the worst advice to give a writer actually, is write what you know in some ways, um, because it, it can be very limiting. But if I start from that place of writing what I know, and then I fictionalize it in order to be able to tell the story that I need to tell. Um, and so I guess my process is that I'm writing about whatever is weighing most heavily on me at the time, or, uh, and that I feel like I'm ready to start sort of figuring out, like, why did this happen? Um, if I can cr think about the thing uh, and then create characters who that also might have happened to, and then start to explore all of, like, what happens when something maybe traumatic occurs in your life? How do you experience it? How do you survive it? Um, how does it change you? How does it change other people? So it's, it's I, that's not really a process, but that's sort of what I do. Um, and then once I've written a, like a really rough draft of that and I'm really discovering the characters and things, then I go back and I, most often, um, then I know the story I want to tell that's sort of mine but no longer mine because I figured out a way to in, into this sort of issue or whatever. Um, I start over. I just start completely over, like new, new file and don't even sometimes look at what I've written before because I, I often tell my students, like, you can't write the first page until you've written your last. And I, I really think I, I personally need to understand the, the whole story before I can really write it the way it needs to be written. So, yeah. I also have students, I also tell them that, and it is not true for me. <laughs> it's, it's not. The way that I almost never have a story in mind, I almost never know a plot, I don't even usually have a premise. What happens is one day I sit down and some words show up on the page in a voice. And if and I ask, what is that about? And a lot of times that's not about anything worth pursuing. It goes away. And that's why I work in a notebook and that's why I type all over. The, but sometimes there's a voice and I ask, who is this? Who's telling this? Why did these three lines come out? So I'm going to read like just four lines or something of this. Um, and it's called, it says origin story. I was born in a stable, a deluxe model indoor outdoor stable with a light up roof star and a brass mat flooring, discontinued item. My mom had been carrying a three foot shepherd from the stockroom when the first serious labor pain hit. I've always been impulsive, mom says, and once I got the notion that I had outgrown my current quarters, boom, she knew I was moving out. I had no idea that that was what was gonna show up on this page, and the rest of it is her origin story. It's this long, it's a little prologue. But once it was there, I was like, who's this? And why, what, what where? She was born on the sales floor of a holiday shop. Like, why <laughs> and how did that happen? And I know that there was a little bit of me that was interested. I already had gone to Santa Claus school. I knew I was interested in that. But who this was and how it showed up, I had no idea. And that is how I write. When a voice comes and a certain phrase, I, I talk about writing by echolocation, mm -hmm. that'll just write and there's a, there's a phrase or a something out there in the darkness that pings back and I follow that over and over. And it means that I write really slowly. It means that I, I do the thing that you are always told not to do. I write two pages and put it away. The next day I edit those two pages and write two more. And I, not quite exactly like that because there are days that are more and a few that are less, but that's kind of how I take little steps all driven by voice. And about 40 pages in, I know how I want it to feel when it ends. I don't always know what the ending is, but I know like what's gonna, what all this is, this mess, and how it might feel resolved, mm -hmm. and then the job is to get from here to there. And at that point, I might play around Kekla with a little bit of outline or a few key points, but for the most part, it is a slow two steps back, a little revising two steps forward. Yeah, that's so cool. I mean, I just, this is why I love hearing about people talking about you know entering the story because it, you know you're following a voice, 
you know, I would never frame it that way, but it's so interesting, right? The idea, and, that, and then that has happened to me, where it's like, I wrote a page, and I'm like, what is this? And then it's Chester Keene cracks the code, because it's this little guy with a fastidious little tie who's getting ready for school, and I'm like, yeah, who's that? Right? Yeah, that's so cool. And Joe following emotion, you know, I mean, like, that's also, like, not, like, I, I tend to be more character. Like, I'm coming from this other person, like, this character, like, like, like you. How do they start? Most um... Of the time? Like, so I see them in my mind, but not like physical, like I can't, I'm terrible at describing physical features of my characters. I see some sort of like, almost like essence of the character that's like engaging with another essence of the character. Like, so my very first novel, the season of um, the Rock and the River, the two characters, um, Sam and Stick. So Sam is the 13 year old protagonist and then Stick is his older brother. And they're like talking about how Stick is joining the Black Panther party and Sam is like freaked out by that. And so they're having this conversation, but it's like I see these little kind of people in my mind and they're they're having this conversation. And so it's like, I'm transcribing this conversation that clearly I'm inventing in my head. <laughs> but it's like, I'm seeing something that plays out. And then it's like, I'll see another conversation that they have. And I know those conversations are not adjacent, right? But it's like this other moment. And then it's like this other moment. And it's like one of those, um, like cloud, word cloud kind of things, like where like, there's this big thing in the center, which is like a story about a kid and his brother who were considering joining the Black Panther Party, and then there's like this thing over here, and this thing over here, and this thing over here, and just these like pieces, and I know it's part of the same story, but I have to find the connections, like I have to find the line that brings it all back um, to whatever that core is, and I usually do like know that core, like I know whether I can articulate it or not, like there's a core that I feel that everything is kind of orbiting around and like all this chaos, right, <laughs> that we're throwing at it, like it, has, it does have, there's a gravitational force to the chaos that I'm throwing onto the page, um, but like outlining for me is very much a revision tool. Um, I've, I've written 50, usually about 50 to 80 pages of something and it's a hot mess and it's chunks and it's weird snippets of dialogue and it's little fragments and then I have to say all right I don't know where to go from here I'm going to take every fragment that I have and represent it on a separate post-it note sometimes color-coded if I have some sense of storylines <laughs> and then I lay them out um, and I'm like okay well I know this is sort of at the beginning I know this is sort of in the middle I know this is sort of at the end and then I just lay out all the things in approximate order and then I can start to see well this happens before this but something needs to happen in between so then I know there's like a hole there right and so I start to build the structure around the pieces that I have and that's what shows me the gaps yeah. that I need to fill um, and so that's kind of my if there's a process that's kind of it. <laughs> Did you have a question? I was, does anyone have a question from what we've all been talking about yet? Before? We're feeling yeah. No. I have a question I for Linda. Oh, oh yeah. All right. What, what you're just saying, uh, I'm just curious, when you finish your books, after you have time to reflect on them, do you then get an idea of why you were drawn to that story? Like Joe, I, at some point I do know, like, oh, this is because that jerk <laughs> back, you know, 37 years ago <laughs> said that one thing. Right? <laughs> and then I haven't been able to let that go. Yes. But, but it's really well disguised initially, and, and I can only figure out who they are. It's sort of like when you're talking to a friend and they're telling you this bad thing that happened to them. And you understand it because it's your friend, but you also understand it because you're finding the parallels to how you have experienced something, right? And I feel that way when I write. I finally, I often discover it was about that kid. Yeah. But it's because Francie here is telling me about her kid, like the thing, the, the person who did that to her. Mm -hmm. It would be so much faster if I knew that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. So, so there's that. Well, my question is why YA? Um, Laura, you started with YA. Most of the rest of us have written all over the place. This is my first YA, and it's a young one. So what is it about YA? What is it about that readership or that writing place for you? And any of you could start. Or okay. Hecla could. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's looking at me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I th so, I mean, so the cop-out answer, which yeah. I won't stop with, but the cop-out answer is that I really, I started writing seriously in my early 20s, mm -hmm. in late teens, early 20s, and so in a sense, it was what I knew, 
right? Like I knew what it was to be a teenager. That was when, those were the books I was also reading, right? I had been reading for my whole life. I had loved, you know, serious fiction. I spent hours in the young adult section of my library. It's like I read everything they had, pretty much. Um, so I think it was what I knew at that time. Uh, I didn't know, I knew I was writing. I didn't know I was writing young adult until somebody told me, right? Um, and I'm grateful that somebody told me because I think I wouldn't have done as well in the world of adult writing because for so many reasons. Um, but I'm incredibly passionate about speaking to readers of this age because of how I felt at that age. I um, certainly, as a middle schooler, I felt very lost and confused and in need of friends and mentors and guidance and some sense of how the world could be, and I got that from books. So that's certainly why I write kind of the younger way or middle grade um, that speaks to kind of 12 to 14 year olds. Um, but I, as a teenager, the thing I remember feeling most frustrated by was everybody kind of discounting your abilities and talents and intelligence and uh, you know willingness and desire to contribute. Oh, well, wait till you're older. You'll understand when you're older. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I had this feeling of like, I have, there's things I can do now. And I didn't know how to articulate that at that time. Um, but now that I know to study history and know that like teens my age who are feeling that same kind of energy are were the engine of the entire civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. That's a, a powerful thing to know. And if I had known that as a teenager, I think I would have been able to take action in a different way than I did. And so I, so I felt this kind of, you know, my engine is on and I'm gunning it, but I can't move it out of neutral yet. You know, I gotta wait until like 21, you know? Um, and so to let people know that you don't have to wait, right? That there is power and passion and talent and the ability to actually move and transform the world when you're 12 or 15. Um, and so for me, that, that message is important. Um, and it's something that I want to carry into the world. And it's something that I want to support um, and be part of a conversation about and invite young voices. And I think you know the only way to do that in, in my mind is to sort of meet them where they are and try to um, invite them to be part of the world in a way that a lot of the world doesn't want. Mm -hmm. Um, I, when I, I didn't think of this as a um, YA novel when I started writing it. I thought of it as an like adult fantasy, but uh, I knew I needed to start with the protagonist who is around 17 because it was very important that she be completely naive to her world. Because the concept of the book is kind of like, um, you know most fantasy books have an evil lord like Saruman or Voldemort. In my world, the, the evil lord is the Black Witch, who's the grandmother, the late grandmother of my protagonist. And basically, the idea that I started with is imagine if you know, Voldemort wins or Saruman wins, and the whole world is transformed, and basically they're in power. And then you've got this 17-year-old who's grown up in, in the backwater of that country. All she's ever known is what she's been told by her kind of fascist, theocratic society's history books, their religion. So she thinks that everybody that's a different type of person, you know, she has a whole idea about all these people. And then the, the story, she looks exactly like this grandmother, but she thinks she has no magical power. So the story picks up when she gets thrust into a university, a magical university, and she's thrown into the orbit of people from all over her world and has to find out, you know, um, that the world is a very dangerous place for the granddaughter of Black Witch, and also that maybe what she's been taught is just one perspective. So, but she had to be young for that because she had to know nothing about the world. But it, it got put in as YA, so I, it, it's okay. I mean, I've really enjoyed um, being in that category. It, later on in the story, I had to, um, you know, like, tone down some of the love scenes and so forth. Um, but, yeah. What? <laughs> Of, of uh, jokingly of money to, to put out the uncensored. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a market for that. <laughs> uh, That's what Patreon is for. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, oh my gosh. Um, well, I I was most inspired by young adult literature as a teenager myself. I wasn't much of a reader as a kid. I. Um, I was like more of like the outdoorsy, make-believe kid. Never, and my sister was a reader, and so she always read to me, and I never felt the need to 
to do that on my own, I guess. I don't know. I just, I think, you know, now as an adult reflecting back, I know I can sort of say I think I know why that was, and that was because the books that were available to me I did not see myself in. And so um, they were fine, they were good, but I, I think that they didn't, I didn't fall into a book and want to read more for quite a while, and it wasn't until high school when um, in my high school English class we were all assigned to read The Chocolate War by Robert Cormier. And um, I started to read that book, and within the first chapter or two, I was just, I was kind of in shock, I think, um, glorious shock, that here was someone who told the truth. That this, this world, I was finally reading about a world that re looked like my world, which it sounds funny because it takes place in a Catholic boys school and I am not any of those <laughs> things. But what I mean is that there were, this was a world in which people did cruel things and didn't pay the price. And that was what I was witnessing as a kid a lot. And I just, I was so drawn to this book. Um, and then I read every Robert Carmier book. And then I, when I went to college, I studied children's literature, and particularly young adult literature. Um, and like Kekla, I was still really young. I went right to graduate school um, after graduating. So I was 21 when I started my master's degree in children's literature and just falling in love with all of these, this whole new world to me because I had skipped out on a lot, but also it was the time when um, more and more books were being published that were telling the truth at last. And I wanted to do that too. I wanted to um, explore that. I was studying to be a children's librarian possibly or an editor, but um, for my master's thesis, I was also a very lazy person in some ways. And so for my master's thesis, I asked, instead of writing um, an academic paper, which sounded terrifying to me, I asked, oh, well, could I write a young adult novel instead? Mm -hmm. Thinking it would be so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, but I did do that. And um, Robert Cormier was at a conference at the college that I was attending. I had just graduated with my master's degree, and I had just, I was like, I didn't finish the novel, but I had written, you know, a couple hundred pages of my first young adult novel, and here was Robert Cormier at this conference, and uh, I was so nervous, I went up to the signing line to have him sign my book, and I didn't, I just wrote my name on a sticky note because I was afraid that I would make a fool of myself, but he saw on my name tag that I had just graduated, so he asked me what my thesis was about, because he was very familiar with the program, and I told him that I had written a young adult novel instead, and he lit up. He's just like the sweetest, oh, you'd never know that Robert Cormier wrote the books that he wrote, because he's like the sweetest, nicest guy. And anyway, he wrote his address in the back of my book and said, when you're done, send it to me. And that's why I write for young adults, <laughs> because the, I had this person that I, who changed my life already once, um, offer me this thing um, and showed that he believed in me and so he did read my manuscript and he wrote me this lovely letter and told me he you know saw potential or whatever and we had this wonderful back and forth a few times but it was because of him that um, I pursued finishing this book in the first place but it was also because of his books that I knew um, the potential power of writing for teenagers and how and what what telling the truth can do for them, um, and so now as a as an author whose books are getting banned left and right uh, because of they tell the truth, I just I keep going back to Robert Cormier whenever I feel, you know, questioning why am I doing this? Why do I write these stories? It's because I know as a teenager myself the impact of them. And I think teenagers especially, this is when they need these books. Um, I mean, adults need books too. We, we're moved as adults just the same, but teenagers especially, um, you can go in so many different directions. And I, I, I hate to think of the direction I might have gone in if, I, if that teacher hadn't put that book in my lap that day. So I, I think about that a lot when I choose the stories I write and also who I write for. I think that's so powerful too, because we don't all get to meet Robert Cormier, right? <laughs> like we don't, right? So like that can't be on your um, career plan right now <laughs> for those who are writing. But we can all, and we don't always get to meet Hecla or Lori or Joe, but their books can serve that same 
purpose for us as writers, but also for kids, right? The best books let us feel seen in who we are and give us the power and sometimes a roadmap um, for becoming that even more fully. And I think that for both middle grade and YA, like that, I write what I write because I love what I write and then also because I think it will speak to kids like me. So we've got a few minutes left, 10, and we'd really love to turn this over to, even if it, I hate saying, are there any questions? Because that puts like a big press. What do you want to talk about or what do you want to say? Yeah. Okay, I have a question where I want to talk about. What about false starts? How often do you have false starts? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how are we defining false? I mean, if I haven't finished it yet, I don't know if it's a false start, because oh. it might still turn into a book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you spend time and then realize this is going nowhere and set it aside and, and know you're not coming back to it, or is that just not something? I set things aside all the time without saying definitively that I'm not coming back to it. I mean, I was kind of being jokey before, but like, but genuinely, I feel like when I write something, like, so Chester Keene, I don't have that book here, it's middle grade. Um, I wrote a one-page thing about this little, this little fastidious little boy who's putting on his his outfit to go to school, and he's talking about how sometimes he wears jeans and a polo shirt, but sometimes he wears khakis and a polo shirt. And then you gotta look out, world! It's Chester Keene. Here I come. And he, and he like he has this routine, and it's down. And he's like he has three minutes to eat his Cheerios, and then he has two minutes to put on his shoes. Like he's got this like routine now. Who is this person, right? I wrote that page like. I don't know, six years before I sat down to actually write that novel. Yeah. Um, and so like, I have all these little fragments that I just kind of put in a file that's literally called fragments, right? Where it's just, these are seeds that haven't been planted yet or haven't found the place to grow or whatever metaphor you want to use from seeds. But like it, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, but I feel like, you know, I don't, I, I can't recall ever starting something you know, the, more than a page. I mean, I have a lot of one pages. Um, and actually actively saying to myself, yeah, no, this is never going to be published ever. Let me put it away forever. I, 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 that feels painful because they all come from somewhere. You know, they all come from something important. Um, and so I don't want to say, I mean, there's definitely been books I thought, well, this will never turn into anything. And then lo and behold, five years later, suddenly it is, right? <laughs> you know, like, so I've been more surprised by that than the opposite, <laughs> right? Where I say, oh, yeah, this will never be a thing. And then somehow it becomes one. Um, but I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, fragments, like starting something and not finishing it. I feel like if you get into a place where you're constantly starting something and never finishing anything, that's a different problem. Um, and that's a point when you might want to say, well, what's most important to me? What, you know, I can still have lots of fragments, but what if I pick something and commit to finishing it however long it takes and like really make a point of, you know, having a discipline of returning to it every day or every week or every month, however often you can write, right? And saying, I'm gonna just, I just wanna finish this, even if it's a short story, right? Even if it's a picture book draft that's very short, right? Um, they're still not easy to write, but they're fewer words, so you can get it done, right? Um, and so I, I feel like I've gone off on a tangent, but I don't think that fragments are bad, and I don't think that you can say it, it's, it's put aside forever until, you know, like I just don't think you can ever say that. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Um, I, I also think sometimes when you, you, you like, maybe you have this great, this brilliant idea, right, and you start to write it, but you're just, it's like, you're just not, you're like, it sounded like a great idea, mm -hmm. but it's not coming out right, it's, I'm not feeling it, right? And I think sometimes it's because you might just be coming at it, you need to come at it from another angle that you haven't, that you thought I was gonna write it from this person's point of view, um, but then you realize, okay, this story is really, really important to me, but it just is falling flat whenever I try to sit down to write it, or something's just not quite right. And um, this happened to me with my book, See You at Harry's, where I started it. At this point, I had only written Upper YA, so all of my characters were always like either 16 or older, and so I had this idea for this book, so I just automatically started it from the point of view of a 16-year-old because that's what I'd always done. Um, but the story just didn't feel true to me um, for, for whatever reason. And then, as often happens for me, I don't know about the rest of you, but like when I wake up at 3 or 4 in the morning and I can't sleep and I'm like, anxiety, um, I, a lot of times I just start write, like, kind of like writing in my head, and I for whatever reason, like just the first page of See You at Harry's 
um, I started rewriting it, but it was coming out in a much younger voice. And I, at first I thought, oh, maybe I'll have like a prologue and she'll be younger and then I'll get to my teen. But then I realized, no, this is a story about a, a younger kid. And you can do that. You don't, you're not, it's not like you're only allowed to write YA because that's all you've ever done so far. Um, and so as soon as I started writing it from a more innocent perspective, and that was the key, she was too old to, to she would have known things that she wouldn't, no, if that makes sense. Um, and so I was writing from this new sense of innocence that was actually so refreshing, but then also, of course, became far more crushing um, later on. But so I, it's one thing I often say to my students who are struggling, I'll give them those options. Like, well, what if you tried writing it from this someone else's point of view? Or what if instead of first person present tense, you tried writing it from third person past tense? And I always just say, just try it. You know, just try it, because they're so, uh, my students tend to be like, just so, I can't, I, I did all this work. I can't do it differently. I, I, have, I have five pages written in it. <laughs> And so a lot of times when I do that, it's, it's so lovely because then they'll say, Joe, you were right, or whatever. Like, that is not the best thing as a teacher to be told you were right. But no, it's, um, it's just like, if you're, it's almost like um, granting. I can grant my, my students that permission all the time. And in fact, I demand it. And so I think we need to do that to ourselves to like grant ourselves or even demand it of ourselves to try new angles when we know we have an important story to tell, but we just can't figure out whose voice it should be in, then try writing it from lots of different ones until you land on the right one. So never be afraid that it's a false start or that you've wasted time because it's all part of the process. I think the word that everybody is probably pushing back against, against is false. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Many of us have multiple starts, multiple points of entry. Three of my novels started as picture books. Right. Two turned into middle grade. One I had this one was originally a non-fiction-y picture book about my time at Santa Claus School. So they just turned out to be story goals. <laughs> well, and it was publishers in each case who said, uh, there's more story in, in this case. There's more story there. There's more story. I want to know more about this person. In this case, no, we don't tell children there's no Santa. So you better <laughs> write for an age where and I'm so sorry if there's anyone here who still <laughs> is holding that belief. Can I go into it? Yeah, please. Um, so, practically every book in my series, I've thrown out around 100 to 200 pages that weren't working. And one thing I, I say to, to authors who get in touch with me, especially young ones, well, everybody, is they'll, they'll say, I could never write anything as good as, as that. I'll be like, okay, when you, when you look at any of these books, you're looking at something that, first of all, went through developmental edit, the professional editor, and the whole thing was rewritten. Then after that, they did chapter edits to guide you through how to fix your chapters. Then it went through copy edits, which, I'm sorry, line edits, which is to get your paragraphs and everything so that they're not a mess. Then it went through copy edits and the sensitivity read nowadays, too. So, um, you know, you, if you saw this when it first started, it's not going to look all that different than what you're writing in your bedroom right now. So don't feel like you can't be an author, is the, is the first thing. And second thing is, um, you know, yeah, I throw out like 100, 100 to 200 pages, but I think those, well, like you were talking about, those tangents sometimes turn into, you know, like halfway through my book, I don't know where it came from. I got this idea in my world of the Fae to have these death Fae. I feel like these, I don't know, all my Fae are connected to a different part of nature. And I'm so obsessed with them. I actually want to write a standalone novel when I'm done because they're not bad guys, but they're just connected to the parts of nature that are really uncomfortable, like predators and spiders and, I don't know, like breakdown and all the things that are really awful in nature that you can't have in nature without. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, the idea is that, you know, yeah, you go out a lot, but sometimes just writing really messy, that's where you get the really good ideas. We are out of time. However, each what did you have something you really wanted to ask though? Okay, I appreciated the sad face though. That was nice. Um, so each of us though would be happy to talk more. I'll speak for all of us and say we'd be happy to talk more about this. We're going to be in the other room where the bookstore is with all of our books. 
people will sign whatever books are here. But first, we just want to thank you all for being so great, for joining us here. This They're going to be in the main reading room signing books, and you can chat with them there. Uh, but before they head out, and since this is our last panel of the day, I just want to give a few closing remarks on behalf of the Green Mountain Book Festival. We just really want to thank everybody for coming and for just making this weekend so special and so fun. Um, and without your support, we would not be able to have this festival and to just further celebrate the literary community of Vermont. We want to do a special thanks to Kate Mesner, who put together all of the programming for today. She just amassed such an amazing collection of authors and I think just really kind of made it such a fun day for, you know, kids of all ages and, and all of us and families and stuff, so we really thank her for that. I also really just want to sh uh, thank personally uh, Barbara Shatara, who is on our board uh, and is a librarian here, and she has really done so much behind the scene work, so just put all this together. <laughs> Finding food, everything you can imagine is all on Barbara. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors one last time because without them and without the help of individual donors, we just would not be able to do this festival. So thank you so much to Burlington City Arts, to Hanson and Doremus, Media Factory, Northfield Savings Bank, Pomerlo Real Estate, UVM Humanities Center, Vermont, uh, Vermont Arts Council, and Vermont Humanities. And a really special thanks to uh, Fletcher Free Library, who is one of our sponsors and has helped us in more ways than one, but is also allowing us to host all of our programming here and just doing such a great job of welcoming all of us. Um, and then also to our main sponsor, Phoenix Books, who really, without them, we would not be able to have this festival, and they have been selling books to everybody all afternoon and really just been a presence here and such a big part of our community. And most of all, thank you all for coming and for celebrating books and authors and for showing up and showing up for the arts in Burlington. Um, this is a wrap on the 2023 Green Mountain Book Festival, and so we can't wait to see what next year brings and thank you again so much.